Okay, we're going to go ahead and uh, show this uh, video. This is about what's called uh, the Walther Lee. And some of the folks who are like a little bit older than I am, uh, who grew up in the Lutheran Church, may remember the Walther Lee. Uh, C.F.W. Walther was the first president of the denomination that we know as the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. And so he was among that crew that came over from Germany uh, 170 some years ago. And uh, we'll talk about that in our last session. The last session is kind of the history of Lutheranism. Uh, but this is the Bible investigation class, it's not a history class. But I'll talk about that in the very last session in the later part of May. But, but Walther was elected to be the first president of uh, our church body. And so there was a youth uh, league formed called the Walther League in honor of him. So when they talk about that, that's how that's the connection. But let's, let's watch. In 1912, the importance of social activities for the young people of St. Peter's was realized by Robert Denninger and T.J. Cock, who organized the Lutheran Boys Club. Later, a similar organization was founded for the girls. In 1914, the clubs joined together and formed the Concordia Farron with a membership of 75. Members of the four confirmation classes of high school age then came together and organized the Junior Walter League. In 1915, the Concordia Farron joined the Walter League and then took part in its activities and projects, many of which were held at the Lutheran Center. The societies of the Southern Indiana Zone, the Indiana District, as well as the Walter League of Indiana, Kentucky, and Ohio held their conventions there. In 1949, several boys from St. Peter's attended the International Walter League Convention in Houston, Texas, and the Houston Chronicle published a picture of one St. Peter's boy with the headline, Drummer Wins Praise at Talent Festival. This convention also included a trip to Galveston Beach with a shrimp boil and a real Texas rodeo and barbecue. First time experiences for some of the participants. Other activities Walther Leaguers enjoyed were putting on plays such as Jenny and Dreamland, bowling and ping pong games at the Lutheran Center, as well as hay rides, wiener roasts, scavenger hunts, Brown County picnics, skating parties, talent festivals, dinners and programs. In a 1950 talent show at Valparaiso, two local boys entered a 15-foot sailboat they had made. The varied activities of all of these organizations enabled many of St. Peter's young people to have an opportunity to socialize with other young Christians in an enjoyable and safe environment. Many adults today remember fondly the pleasant times they experienced at Concordia and Walter League activities and events. Okay, so uh, our youth uh, group now is not called the Walther League. The Walther League kind of went by the wayside, I don't know, 40 years ago or something like that. But we still have, obviously, youth ministry. In fact, uh, every three years within the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, there is uh, what's called the National Youth Gathering. And they call it the NYG, but me being uh, somebody who's followed sports all my life, I can't, when I hear NYG, that's New York Giants. <laughs> and still, after they've used that phrase for all these years, I still think New York Giants when I hear NYG. So uh, we have, I think, 96 in all from St. Peter's going to the National Youth Gathering. And it is in, uh, it's in, it's in Houston this year, I think. And they were talking about being, is it in Houston, <coughs> Justin? I think it's in Houston. Um, this year and so we have not 96 youth but probably somewhere in the 80s and then some adults that are going along uh, with them as well so we've got some great folks who do some great work with our youth but that's just a little bit of history of uh, all of that uh, Dustin Weber is with us this morning uh, Dustin is a member of our staff here at St. Peter's and he wears a couple of different hats actually more than a couple of different hats uh, but I appreciate his flexibility and uh, he wears them all well and he's here to talk to you about some of the things that he works with and how you might uh, benefit or want to be a part of that. So Dustin, come fill us in. Yeah, good morning, everybody. Uh, the main thing I just want to talk about this morning is our, our groups ministry. And we have a few different types of groups. And the first one is activity groups. And um, as the name suggests, it's just an activity, getting people together, uh, hang out. Um, and so the things that we have right now, we have a couple fitness classes. And then we have a men's basketball group that meets uh, usually weekly. And we have an adult quit volleyball group that meets uh, two Fridays a month, uh, typically. Um, and then we also have, right now, pickleball open gyms on Tuesdays and Thursdays. That's about to, to shut down for, uh, uh, for the spring here. Um, so I have a few more weeks of that left, but it'll start back up as the weather starts getting cold again next year, um, or, or next season in the winter. But um, those are 
some of the opportunities we have again just people being able to come together uh, just just hang out have some fun be in fellowship with one another uh, get some exercise in those um, but the thing with the activity groups is they don't have to just be uh, sports or fitness related so we're looking for other types of groups to get started um, so ways to kind of get plugged in there is obviously if any of those interest you you can get plugged in uh, there just contact me and I'll help you um, get plugged in with those or if there's some activity that you're really passionate about um, and you'd like to get something started, um, whether it's you know euchre night or board game night or something like that, and it doesn't have to be weekly, it can be monthly or even less frequent than that, um, that's kind of an opportunity there. Uh, the next type of group is uh, connect groups, and that's just what you kind of typically think of as normal small groups, uh, usually groups of six to, to 20 people just getting together, studying the word of God together, living life together. Um, and the same thing there, they can those kind of range from meeting weekly to twice a, twice a month to monthly, kind of varies just depending on the group. Um, same thing, if you want to get plugged in, just contact me. Love to get you, I'll ask you kind of some questions, kind of what you're looking for, be able to get you plugged in. Or if you have a group of friends where you're like, hey, we'd like to start one, same thing, contact me. I'd love to support and resource you any way um, that I can to, to make sure I um, get you started off right. Um, and then our third type of group, is something we've been piloting this year called discipleship groups. And so um, with connect groups, there's not a lot of uh, commitment outside of the groups typically. You know, there's not a lot of reading. You kind of just come with your group. You study the word together in that, in that time. Well, discipleship groups is a little bit more of a commitment and uh, intentional in that way where we're going through our reading plan that we're doing as a congregation. And then a few other things, so we're using something called the HEAR Journal, uh, where people are going through each week and journaling some things and basically um, just praying about it and meditating on the Word and writing some things down about how God is speaking to them. And then they're coming together on, on a weekly basis to discuss that in that group. And just to be an encouragement to one another, uh, to encourage each other to live out their faith, to be able to remind each other of the Gospel on a weekly basis. Um, just be that encouragement in that group. And there's a few other discussion things that go on in, that, in those groups as well. Um, but really it's more of a kind of a mentor type, uh, type group where we're really trying to be able to encourage people in that way. And so if that's something that interests you, like I said, we're still kind of in that pilot phase, but still please reach out to me, let me know. Um, we're hopefully continuing to be able to multiply those groups, especially as we go look into going into the fall here. Um, but again, any of, those, any of those things, if they interest you or if you have questions about, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. You can email me or just call the church office. Just call, call Molly. Um, ask for me or if you don't remember my name. Just say you have questions about groups and um, she'll be able to get you connected. So. Thanks, Doug. Any questions for Dustin? A lot of great opportunities to get plugged in. Uh, and some of them are really, they're just, they're in a, kind of not heavy duty spiritual kind of thing. Some are just friendship, relationship, hanging out with one another. We've said that, that our, our Christianity is certainly it's about a vertical relationship between us and God, but it's also about a horizontal relationship and our relationship with others. And so, however you want to plug in, Dustin's your guy. Thanks, Dustin. Thank Appreciate you. you being here. Thank you. So, um, I think that uh, I'm, I'm done with uh, being absent from class now. Um, I was telling uh, Brooke and Mark, I think this is the most, I've missed three sessions, this is the most I've missed, I think, in the, all the time I've ever taught the class. But you know, it's kind of hard to say no to Hawaii, right? And that was the first two weeks. And then my, uh, my granddaughter uh, had her fifth birthday last Saturday, and uh, they used to live in Phoenix, and it would have been impossible, not impossible, but difficult to get out there for that. And now they live four hours away, so I thought, I'm going. And it was good. It was good. So we had a safari-themed birthday party, and uh, it was a lot of fun. We... Um, there were little animals that were hidden. They did it at the church when your dad is the pastor, which is the case with my granddaughter. Her dad is the pastor. So you can come to the church and have your birthday party, and you can hide animals all over the place, in the sanctuary, and in the basement, and in your dad's office. And I think they had like 10 different animals that the kids on the safari hunt were finding and they made their own little binoculars with uh, toilet paper rolls, you know, and it was a fun day. So I'm planning to be with you unless the Lord knows something that I don't know uh, for, the la for the next several weeks. So we will not meet next week. Next week is Easter, and we have four worship services, 6.30, our sunrise service, and then 8 o'clock, 9.30, and 11 o'clock. So we will not have uh, any classes next Sunday. Then we'll resume the weekend after that. So we'll meet again April 24, May 1, 8, 15, and 22. 
So, uh, and then our last session is on May 22. So anyway, that's kind of the schedule that we have going forward. Um, if, you, um, uh, if you haven't already, if you put your name on uh, one of the white sheets on the table, I'd appreciate that. That's just helpful for me. And let's see, you had a, um, there was one question that came on uh, one of the four by six cards. And these are, again, on your table that if you have any questions you want to write down, as opposed to just asking uh, out loud, uh, feel free to do that. This one says, what is your opinion on a member of St. Peter's taking communion at another church, uh, like Catholic or some other church? So uh, what about if uh, somebody from St. Peter's uh, visits a Catholic church or a Methodist church or a Baptist church with somebody else and they have communion? How do I, what do I, do I think they should take communion or not? The answer I'm going to give you may not be the answer that a pastor at this Lutheran church gives you or that Lutheran church gives you, okay? Because I don't know that biblically it's specifically addressed. I know that there are opinions on this. I've heard the opinions of other clergy on this. I'm going to give you my opinion based upon how I understand scripture. So there are some pastors I know in our own denomination who would say no, uh, you should not go to communion uh, at another church that has a different understanding of the Lord's Supper. Uh, so if, uh, if one church, let's say they don't believe in the real presence, they don't believe that the body and blood of Jesus are really present in and with and under the bread and wine, then you shouldn't be communing there because they have a different understanding of communion. Um, that's not the position that I would take. Um, for me, the Lord's Supper is the Lord's Supper is the Lord's Supper regardless of where it's offered. Whether it's offered in a Lutheran church that believes in the real presence, the body and blood of Christ are present with the bread and the wine, whether it's in a Roman Catholic church where the understanding is more transubstantiation, where the bread, it's, they would believe the bread is changed into the body of Christ and the wine is changed into the blood of Christ, or a church that believes in more symbolic presence, that the bread simply symbolizes the body of Christ and the wine or the juice simply symbolizes the blood of Christ. Um, I believe that the Lord's Supper is the Lord's Supper, whether regardless of what that group of people believe. Baptism is baptism, whether you're immersed or sprinkled or however. If you are baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, you are baptized. It's, it's legitimate. So from my understanding, if I go to another church that has a different, I'm not talking about if I go to a Latter-day Saints or a Jehovah Witness where there's a totally different understanding of who God is and what the scriptures are. Okay, I'm not putting, and I'm not saying that to throw stones at Latter-day Saints or Jehovah Witness uh, or Unitarians, but they have a very different understanding biblically of who is God and who is Jesus. And so I'm not talking, but I'm talking about mainline Christians. Um, so I have communed at, those, at their churches. Because I believe that I'm receiving the body of Christ and the blood of Christ for the forgiveness of my sins. Now, some will say, but the Lord's Supper is a declaration of unity of faith. And that's why we say only those who believe as we believe should come to our table. I don't find that in the scriptures. Jesus said, take and eat, this is my body. Take and drink, this is my blood. Give it and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. The Lord's Supper is for the forgiveness of sins. So, um, so Mark Tyke, if he visits uh, another church, uh, he has on occasion, not every time, but on occasion communed there because I believe that Christ comes to me uh, with those elements. Um, but that's a choice, choice for you to make. I'm not saying that you have to. If you're not comfortable going to communion at the Methodist Church or the Presbyterian Church or the Catholic Church or the Episcopalian Church, then don't. No. Uh, but I'm simply saying that if you choose to, I don't think your conscience needs to bother you that, oh, I shouldn't have done this. Uh, but again, if you were to ask, uh, uh, if we had 10 uh, Lutheran pastors in the room, uh, not everybody would take that position. I don't think nine would take that position, I mean the other position. But, you know, there's just a different, there are some things in Scripture that aren't as clear as we want to make them. So that's my response to that um, question. Okay, so and now are there any questions? Last week we talked about heaven, right? I think that was, it's been a long time ago. I remember Dean and I, uh, we, we recorded this, I think it was after a Lenten service a couple of weeks ago. So 
When was it? Yeah, Thursday we left to go up to Chicago, so it was after the Lenten service, and I think it was heaven. Is that what we talked about last week? Okay, good. Are there any questions about that topic? Any questions that you have in light of what was said, or any other questions you have about the whole issue of heaven, or life beyond this world? Okay, all right. And if any other come to mind, feel free to write them down, and we'll, we'll address them um, next week. All right, so uh, we are this week going to be talking about a prayer. I think, is that the next one that you have in your workbook? Okay, that's what we're going to be talking about is, is uh, prayer. What time, uh, what, and what page is that on? Page 35. Okay, so we're the Lord's Prayer and the Christian's Prayer Life. Um, it says at the top of the page that the Lord's Prayer is found in Matthew 6 and Luke 11. And Jesus, uh, uh, so Matthew 6 is a part of what we know as the Sermon on the Mount. And the Sermon on the Mount was really Jesus teaching to his disciples about what does it mean to live as a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. We have dual citizenship. I have citizenship here as a citizen of the United States of America, and I have citizenship in heaven, in the kingdom of God. Uh, one of our hymns says, I'm but a stranger here, heaven is my home. Uh, the church that I grew up in was called Pilgrim Lutheran Church. The concept of we're moving on. You know, this isn't the final stop. And so, uh, understand that we have dual citizenship. For me, for me, my primary citizenship is in heaven. So if I have to make a choice between loyalty to nation or loyalty to God, my choice is going to be loyalty to God. But sometimes nation makes bad choices. It does. Government is a human institution. It was established by God, but it's a human institution. Some of the laws of our land are in conflict with the will of God, if you know the scriptures. So if I have to make a choice, you know, if, if I was in Hitler's, we'll talk about this under the fourth commandment. We'll start the Ten Commandments the week after Easter. But under the fourth commandment, honor your father and mother, it really talks about our relationship with those in positions of authority over us. So it speaks about how do I, as, a, as an employee, relate to those who have oversight over me? Or how do I, as a citizen, relate to the government who has a, a oversight over me? Uh, and so, and the Bible says we must obey God rather than men. So if we were in Hitler's uh, army 60 years ago, uh, no, 80 years ago, uh, what would we have done if Hitler said go round up the Jews? And we have stories about people like Corey Ten Boom and others who, who chose to protect the Jews. But that comes with a price. So when Jesus was preaching his Sermon on the Mount, he said, listen, if you're going to live as a follower of me, if you're going to live as a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, here's how I want you to live. And that's what Matthew 5, 6, and 7 is all about. If, I were, if, if somebody said, uh, they live in, a, let's say, a persecuted country, and they said, we can only have like 10 chapters of the Bible. That's it. That's all we can have. See, we, many of us have three or four or five Bibles in our home. There are some people that don't have, don't have that at all. I would say Matthew 5, 6, and 7 is huge because it's where Jesus tells us, here's how I want you to live. It's in Matthew 5, 6, and 7 where Jesus speaks about uh, turning the other cheek. It's in Matthew 5, 6, and 7 where Jesus talks about praying for your enemies. It's in Matthew 5, 6, and 7 where Jesus talks about uh, forgiving those who have wronged us. Uh, just a lot of, here's what it means to live as a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. And he gives us the Lord's Prayer also in that section. And he delivered that sermon um, up here on the northern edge of the Sea of Galilee. So again, I think I've shared with you that Jesus spent about 75, 80% of his time right up here uh, in this region. I used to think as a kid that he hung out around Bethlehem and, and Jerusalem all the time. But no, he was born in Bethlehem when he was a little baby, Joseph took him and Mary over here to Egypt to hide because Herod wanted to kill him. Then after Herod died, they came back up here to Nazareth in the region of the Galilee where they lived. Jesus lived there until he was 30 years old. And then Jesus took up residence in Capernaum, which actually is kind of right on the, the Sea of Galilee. And that's where his earthly headquarters were. His ministry headquarters were, was in Capernaum. And he delivered the Sermon on the Mount on the Sea of, uh, of Galilee. 
So that's the location. And then let me go back a f some slides because I want to show you kind of what they would have been looking at as he was delivering that uh, sermon. Here we go. Uh, Okay, that's the Sea of Galilee. So that might have been their view. I don't know exactly where they were located, but that might have been their view. And so when Jesus speaks about in the Ser uh, Sermon on the Mount about a city up on a hill cannot be hidden. And so they would have been looking over here and, and, uh, and so there are mountains all around uh, the Sea of Galilee, kind of the city on the hill. And they talk about the flowers of the field, how they don't clothe themselves. And, and the birds of the air, and the birds were probably flying over. So that's where Jesus delivered his Sermon on the Mount. And in that, he speaks about uh, how do we pray. So let me just also add this. When you, <clears throat> so growing up, a good Lutheran, I was taught to end the Lord's Prayer with, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever, amen. And then when I would go to church with my wife, who was then my girlfriend at her Methodist church when we were in high school, I would always, oftentimes catch myself because they say, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, amen. And us good Lutherans are adding on one more amen uh, and forever at the end. It's a little bit awkward. And then when we go to our, our, our Catholic friends' weddings and they pray the Lord's Prayer, they stop at, uh, they don't even say, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. They stop earlier than that. And, and when I was younger, you know, we learn things in life. I was, I was kind of a know-it-all cocky kid. Maybe I'm still a know-it-all cocky adult. I don't know. But I used to think those Catholics, they don't even know how to pray the Lord's Prayer. They don't even, they don't even pray the ending until I looked up in the scriptures, and that's not even there. <laughs> so the Catholics are not wrong. And it's not that it's wrong that we add, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever, or that we add on one more and ever. It's just that, uh, so just understand that. So don't throw stones at somebody when they say those words a little bit differently um, than you do. So what I've done is uh, in this material for this unit, and we'll get through a significant part of it today. We may have to finish the end next time we come together. But what I've given you is in Luther's catechism. Now, for some of you know what that is, others may not. So. Martin Luther, and again, we'll talk about him at the end of May in the last session, but Martin Luther was the one for whom the Lutheran Church was named. And Luther never wanted the church to be called the Lutheran Church. Luther said, I didn't die for you. I'm not your savior. You're not to worship me. Don't call yourselves Lutherans. And we'll go into more detail later, but ultimately Luther said, all right, okay, if you want to do it, call yourselves Lutherans. But Luther in his day, and, and Luther lived uh, 500 years ago, okay? Um, Luther lived 500 years ago, and in Luther's day, Luther discovered that the clergy, many of the clergy, were, were very poorly trained theologically in his day. And, and many of the people who were Jesus followers didn't know the scriptures very well. And it was Luther who translated the scriptures from uh, the original languages into the German language so that the average German person could read the scriptures. Before that, they just had to take the word of the priests. And the, <clears throat> the scriptures, remember the Old Testament in Hebrew, the New Testament in Greek. Uh, the scriptures were also in Latin, which was the language of the scholars, but they weren't in the common language. So you can imagine, I mean, how many of you know Greek? How many of you know Hebrew? How many of you know Latin? And, and so Luther then uh, had the scriptures translated into the language of the people so that they could see for themselves what the scriptures taught. But in the meantime, he wrote what he called a catechism. And a catechism is just an instructional book. And he talked about the six chief parts. So he had a section, and this was for parents to teach their kids about the faith. That was the purpose of it. So that mom and dad could have an instructional tool to teach their children uh, the Christian faith. So. Yeah, he, he has a section about the Apostles' Creed. Who is God the Father? And then who is God the Son? Who is God the Holy Spirit? And then he wrote an explanation about who is, you know, I believe uh, that God has made me in all things. That he has created my body and soul, eyes, ears, my memory, all my... It, it, so so the, the Apostles' Creed. He has a section on baptism in the Catechism. He has a section on the Lord's Supper. Uh, another one of the six chief parts. He has a section um, on, uh, on uh, prayer 
and that's, that's what we're going to look at here. He has a section on the um, uh, Office of the Keys, uh, and he has a section on the Ten Commandments. Those are the six chief parts. So under the Lord's Prayer, what I've done is I've taken what you see in those boxes, I have lifted those from Luther's Catechism. Okay? So the language seems a little bit old, and it is. It's 500 years old language, translated into English. Luther didn't write in English, he wrote in German. So when you see a section in a box, that is taken out of Luther's Catechism, that we still use, okay? So, as we go through the Lord's Prayer, here's my, um, my opinion. I don't think, where was I? I was somewhere, and somebody had a question. Maybe my son-in-law brought it to me. Yeah, I think somebody had brought it to him who said, is a, is a worship service a, a Lutheran worship service if it does not include the Lord's Prayer? Because I think at one time it had a service and it didn't include the Lord's Prayer. That's not Lutheran. Sometimes we get so worked up over things that just... I mean, the Lord's Prayer is a great prayer. I mean, there's no reason not to use it, but if it's not included in a specific service, it doesn't mean that it's not a legitimate Lutheran worship service. If one of the creeds isn't included in one of the services, it doesn't mean that it's not a legitimate... But I'm, I'm just telling you, those push some people's buttons. So anyway, I don't think that the Lord's Prayer was intended to be prayed like in 27 seconds or 23 seconds. Or It's my opinion that when Jesus taught his disciples how to pray that the Lord's Prayer is much more of an outline and a guide for how to pray as opposed to just praying it straight through. I'm not saying it's wrong to pray it straight through. It's fine to pray it straight through. But I think there's much more between the lines and between the words of the Lord's Prayer. And that's why we're going to slow down. Instead of covering it in 27 seconds, we're going to take you know, an hour or so to talk about the Lord's Prayer. Because there's a lot there. So, as Luther breaks down the Lord's Prayer in the Catechism, the introduction is, Our Father who art in heaven. Okay. So I want to unpack that. The word Father. In the scriptures, that comes from the word Abba. I know there's a musical group from the 70s called Abba. I wasn't crazy about their music, but, you know, they're... They've, they've done pretty well. They've sold a lot of records. I think they're some Scandinavian country. Two guys and two gals. But the word Abba in Aramaic, which was the language Jesus would have spoken. Jesus didn't speak King James English. He didn't speak German. He spoke Aramaic, which was a derivative of uh, Hebrew. The word Abba literally translated means daddy or papa. It's a very endearing term. We translate it father here. But really, it's a much more endearing term. I think about um, the movie Sound of Music. I had to watch that, I don't know how many times as a kid. My mom loved the movie Sound of Music, and I, I, I probably have everything memorized in it. Not because I wanted to, but because I was forced to watch it. You know, if it was on TV, we watched it. If it was at the drive-in theater, we watched it. If it was, a, we just watched the Sound of Music. My granddaughter, what's kind of funny is my granddaughter just turned five when she was, I think, three for Halloween. She was Maria on Halloween <laughs> with her little ukulele and hat and, and her, she had a thing that said do re mi on her so that people could maybe put it together. So, um, but the father in The Sound of Music was much more father than papa or, or daddy, right? If you, if you saw the movie Sound, if you didn't, you know, it's a good movie. It's a good movie. And if you didn't see it, um, the, the father, this is a father who was widowed, and he has a whole slew of kids, and he has a nanny or a governor who comes in to try to take care of the kids because they're all wild. And he's a, he's a military officer in the uh, Austrian army, right? And he comes in, and he blows his whistle, and the kids come in, and they're at attention, and they salute, and that's father, okay? No fun. Just father. Abba, when Debbie and I, I don't know, our kids were little, and we had gotten a chair. Debbie's uh, mom and stepdad had gotten rid of some furniture. They were going to get some new furniture. So we got uh, uh, their old lazy boy chair. 
And that was, I don't know how long when Lazy Boy Chairs came out, but I thought I'd died and gone to heaven, you know? <laughs> you didn't have the button, but you pulled out of that crank and you could pull, and it was just nice big chair, and it was in good shape. But one of the favorite things for me when our kids were little was that we would sit in the chair together. So David uh, was a big sports fan, who still is. And so he and I would sit there and we would watch, you know, the Pacers or the Bulls or somebody. And, and, and um, with Aaron and Shanti, you know, oftentimes we'd read books or we'd watch movies. When we finally got rid of that chair, the arms were like, they were pushed out. You know, they weren't, they weren't solid. They were very flexible. And, and, and frankly, I, I'd still let my kids sit with me in that lazy boy chair if they wanted to. They're not going to. It'd be kind of weird, right? I mean, I'm 64 and they're in their 30s. But the reality is, as a dad, you never get tired of having your kids climb up on your lap or sit in the chair with you. You, you, you don't. And now we get to do that with grandkids. So when Jesus starts this prayer, he says, Our Abba. <coughs> He wants us to understand that the creator of the universe is one who is our daddy, our papa, who loves us with the perfect love, who loves for us to climb upon his lap, who loves to wrap his arms around us. Some people are afraid of God. Some people are scared to death of God. Some people think God's up there with a lightning bolt in one hand and a sledgehammer in the other waiting to let them have it. No. So sometimes for me, when I am on my own doing prayer time or devotional time, and actually where I do that is in kind of, a, it's not a lazy boy chair, but it's a very comfortable chair. It's in the basement, and we have a walkout basement, and so I can look out, you know, in the back, and it's a very comfortable chair, and I will close my eyes and sometimes just picture myself climbing up on the lap of God. And it doesn't matter how old you are. God just says, come and climb on my lap. Lean into me. <clears throat> Lay your head on my shoulder or against my chest and just, just relax. Take a deep breath. Our Father, our Abba, our Daddy, our Papa. So if you're filling in the, the first blanks there. And the Bible says that when we come into this world, we come into this world spiritually dead. Ephesians chapter 2, we talked about this in baptism. It says you were dead in your trespasses and sins. That's why Jesus said you must be born again. And to be born again means to have life in Christ. And when we come into a relationship with God, the Bible uses adoption language. Paul in his New Testament letters talks about how we have been adopted into the family of God. Now some people have a negative view of adoption. Some people kind of make jokes about adoption. I know I've been with families before, very, very rare, but maybe, you know, somebody, uh, one of the parents has died or both parents have died and, and I remember once there were like three or four kids in the family and they said, well, what so-and-so, the youngest one, doesn't know is that they were really adopted and, and mom or dad never told them that. Ha, 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 ha. Like, that's funny. Or I'll talk to families and they'll say, well, how many children do they have? Well, they have four kids, but two of them are adopted. As if there's something wrong with that. And maybe I didn't, wasn't very sensitive to that until I became the father of a child who was adopted. And so if I were in the company of somebody and my daughter who was, came into our family through adoption was present and somebody said, well, she's adopted, I would say, well, I would think, I wouldn't say it. You're an idiot. <laughs> I would think it. I wouldn't say it. Um, because, so why do you point out that distinction? Yes, she came into our family through adoption. Why do you feel the need to point that out? When... Debbie and I had our first two children, biologically, we were stuck with what we got. <laughs> right? When you go through the process of adoption, it's a long, detailed process. And you fill out this paperwork and, you know, would you be willing to adopt a child with this issue or this issue or this issue or this issue or this issue? 
Um, and then they have uh, social workers come to your house and they interview you and they, your kids and they want to make sure it's a safe place for a child to come. And, and then in our case, um, uh, they sent us a video and they said uh, we, were still, we were living in the old parsonage over here, the house over here on the corner, the, whatever, the Reeves house now that somebody else owns. And it was, uh, it was in the summer of, uh, uh, and, and we got this video, uh, summer of 1993. And it was a video, because I said VHS tapes back then, of our uh, potential daughter. And they, do you still want her? We have every option to say no to all these different things. And the reality is that God has made us his own in spite of all our blemishes, all of our warts, all of our imperfections, all of our defects. God says, I want you to be mine. You know, uh, we'll talk about the whole issue of abortion under the fifth commandment when we talk about the commandments. But um, sometimes we've sought, and I'm, I'm not going to go into it in great detail now, but sometimes if we think something may not be right, then maybe it's just easier to terminate. If I, I, could, I could bring in here five families from St. Peter's who have a child who has uh, Downs and say, um, if you, uh, in hindsight now, uh, would you have preferred that you would have aborted that child uh, in the womb? They would, have all, they would either get angry or laugh. But if we think something's not right, I mean, who's? So in adoption, we make a choice. And we say, yeah, I, I want you. I want you. Shanti came to us at the age of four. She didn't speak a word of English. We didn't speak a word of Tamil. I remember we picked her up at O'Hare Airport. She came with a chaperone. And we said to the chaperone, while, and we picked her up like at six o'clock in the morning. And that's when her flight came in. And we were gonna go to breakfast. What does she eat? What does she like? Oh, whatever you eat. We went to, I think, like Denny's because it was the only thing open at that time in the morning. And we had a big breakfast, and I remember halfway through, Shanti threw up her breakfast. <laughs> um, and so it was, you know, and so here was this, we have this little girl, four-year-old little girl, who doesn't speak a word of English. And, and I wouldn't trade that for the world and the gift that she is to us. And I don't love her any less or any more than my other two children who came biologically. So to say, our Father who art in heaven, we need to understand this. God has adopted us into his family. And when you do an adoption, by the way, don't ever say, well, how much did it cost to adopt that child? What'd you pay for that child? Again. <laughs> Just be there and go through that. Some of you have adopted children. People can be very insensitive. But there are fees connected with that. I mean, when Shanti came here, somebody had to pay for the airplane ticket for her to come over here. Somebody had to pay for the, for the chaperone to bring her over here. Somebody had to pay for other kinds of you know, shots and everything else. Your adoption and mine was paid for with the blood of Christ. To call God our Abba, our Daddy, our Papa, our Father. The fact that he adopted us into his family, he did that at a cost. And the cost was the life of his son, Jesus. So thank him that he's chosen to adopt you into his family. He could have said, listen, they're going to be a whole lot of trouble. I remember our, our daughter, Erin. Erin's now 38. She's the mother of our two grandkids. And uh, I can remember when I was, uh, it was like, Aaron was born in December, and I was asked uh, for that New Year's Eve to speak at a New Year's Eve retreat with high school and college kids. And I remember saying to the person in charge, um, what do you want me to talk about? And he said, I don't care whatever you want to talk about. And so I was so excited. Maybe this was when Aaron was a year old. Maybe it was a year after her birth. And I thought, well, I'm going to talk about my love for my daughter and God's love for us. Because when you become a parent, 
your capacity to love like gets shift you know from like second gear to fifth gear right you don't know you didn't you know you had this capacity you didn't even know that it was there until you have kids so I talked about that but then all of a sudden when Aaron was like I don't know two or two or three or something like that man this sweet little angelic thing <laughs> what happened <laughs> Now, she's still very strong-willed, very, and her daughter is very strong-willed. And I just smile every time I see that come out of my granddaughter. But, you know, there are things with our kids along the way that there are some things that I've dealt with as a dad that I never would have thought of I had to deal with, never. And some of it's really difficult. And those of us who are parents, we kind of, we've been there and done that. And some of those challenges and difficulties are different for each of us, but they're hard sometimes. But it doesn't mean we love our kids any less. They're still our kids, we still love them. So thank God that he's chosen to adopt you into his family. And thank him that he's paid for your adoption with the blood of his son, Jesus. Um, and then it says the importance of the word our in our father. When Jesus taught us to pray, he taught us to pray our Father, not just Father or Abba, but our Father, our Abba. This morning, um, I don't know, at 8.45 in our sanctuary, a group of people prayed our Father. A little bit later today, around, I don't know, 11.30 or something like that, a group of people are going to pray our Father. But there's a good chance that down the street, a block down the street at First Christian, those words might be spoken at First Methodist or First Presbyterian. Those words might be spoken at um, Calvary Community. Those words might be spoken at Westside Community Church. Those words might be spoken. Here's the point. Our implies that we are all in this thing together as the body of Christ. And that all of us who claim Jesus as Savior are brothers and sisters in Christ. So why would we be throwing stones or belittling or criticizing other believers in Christ because they do things differently than we. I remember when we started to offer more contemporary worship at St. Peter's and there would be some people who would clap to some songs or some people who would raise their hands and some people would say, well, if they want to be like those holy rollers, they should go somewhere else, <laughs> as if to imply that that's wrong. Um, so... Uh, when my kids were little, they would, what, what bothered me the most as a dad was when my kids were intentionally mean to each other. I mean, siblings are going to fight. And usually it's David and Aaron because everybody was nice to Shanti. They were nice to Shanti. But David and Aaron sometimes were like this for a long time. And knowing as a dad how that makes me feel when I would see my kids being intentionally mean to each other, how do you think our Father in heaven feels when he sees people in the body of Christ being mean to each other? You know, Lutherans thrown stones at the Catholics, and the Episcopalians thrown stones at the Presbyterians, and the Methodists thrown stones at the Baptists, or the Christian Republican thrown stones at the Christian Democrat, or the Christian Democrat thrown stones at the Christian Republican. We're in this thing together. And so our says something. It says that we are in this thing together. We may not always agree on everything. I mean, it's probably good that we don't, politically or theologically. or It's probably good that we don't because, you know what, one of us might be wrong. And it might be me. It's good to have the perspective of others and learn from others. But to say that Jesus taught us to say our Father, which there's something behind that. So uh, that's why I sometimes we just, you know, our Father who art in heaven, what's that take? Two or three seconds to say? But there's a lot there. And I would encourage, if you, if you want, uh, in your own devotional time or prayer time, maybe on uh, one day of the week uh, in your prayer time, you just focus on our Father who art in heaven, and you and you you know and you say, Father, I, I thank you that you're. I mean, I'm I'm climbing up in your lap right now, and you just imagine yourself doing that, and 
his arms wrapped around you. And I thank you that, that you are my father, my Abba, my daddy. I thank you that you've chosen, you've chosen me. Jesus said, I, you didn't choose me, I chose you. I thank you that you've chosen me in spite of all my imperfections and all my flaws and all my weaknesses and everything about me that, that may just bother us, that you still love me. So that's the introduction, okay? Our Father uh, who art uh, in heaven. And the fact that he's our Father who art in heaven means sometimes I, I find not all earthly fathers. Now, I think all of us who are dads, um, we want to do the right thing and the best thing as a dad. But there are times, and I'm sure this is true of moms as well, that we kind of wish we had a do-over. We wish we would have maybe said that a little bit differently, or I wish we wouldn't have done that, or we wish we would have done this and instead of that. I mean, there, there are always things in life that we wish we could do differently. Um, and, there are some, and there are some fathers, though, that are just, for whatever reason, maybe they, even to create the image of climbing into the lap of God as our father, for some people maybe really disheartening because maybe their earthly father was abusive or mean or hateful. And so that image isn't what, you, what gives you comfort. So who is that person where you found that place of security and safety and, and shelter? Maybe it wasn't your earthly father. Maybe it was a grandparent. Maybe it was your mother. Maybe it was a, uh, somebody else in your family. And while earthly dads and moms, we try to do the best we can, the fact is um, we have a heavenly father who always acts out of love for us, always. So while our earthly parents, while they usually mean well, our heavenly father always means well and always does the right thing, always. Um, there's a song, I, I usually uh, cry when we sing it in church, we don't sing it very often. Um, I am Jesus' little lamb and children of the Heavenly Father because I would sing that to my kids when I would rock them when they were little. So when I hear that, I think about that and I just, it just, I, I can't handle that. And there are probably all of us, some of us probably have certain songs that just touch us, you know. And those are some that touch me just because of my relationship uh, with my kids. So, um, so Luther in his little section up there said, God would by these words tenderly invite us I like that tenderly, to believe that he is our true father and that we are his true children so that we may with all boldness and confidence ask him as dear children ask their dear father. So then the first petition says, hallowed be thy name. So Luther, what does this mean? Luther says God's name is indeed holy in itself, but we pray in this petition that it may be holy among us also. And how is this done? He says, when the word of God is taught in its truth and purity and we as the children of God also lead a holy life according to it this grant us dear father in heaven but he that teaches and lives otherwise than God's word teaches profanes the name of God among us from this preserve us heavenly father so as we unpack this hallowed be thy name a little bit more the first statement says ask the Lord to reveal any areas in which you may be taking his name in vain or using it hallowed be thy name so we want to use God's name in a way that that is holy that hallows his name there's a commandment about this, you should not take the name of the Lord in vain, and we'll unpack that a little bit more under the commandments, so I won't spend a huge amount of time on that. But are we sometimes in our language using God's name in a way that doesn't hallow his name, that doesn't honor and revere his name? So hallowed, we, your name, we want your name to be hallowed. I want to use your name. Um, Luther in his explanation of this commandment says we should use God's name for prayer and praise and giving thanks. Are we using his name properly? Then it says, we bear the name of God. We're called Christians, right? And the word Christian means little Christ. We bear his name. I remember uh, there was a guy, uh, Alexander the Great. And Alexander the Great was considered a great military leader. And he had many conquests. Uh, and he learned of a soldier in his army who was a coward. And Alexander the Great um, approached that soldier. And he was just turning beet red with that soldier because the soldier's name was also Alexander. And he grabbed this guy by the collar and he said to him, young man, um, either change your life or change your name. Because if you're going to bear my name of Alexander and you're going to be a coward, you have no place in my army. 
And to be called a Christian means to be called a little Christ. So in our life, hallowed be thy name, says God. May your name be hallowed in me. When others know that I bear the name of Christ, may they see you in me. And may you be honored. You know, I've said it before. I think one of the reasons why Christianity gets slammed so badly today in so many areas is because many who bear the name of Christ live a life that's anything but reflective of Christ. You know, sometimes I mentioned about our, our political things, you know, Christian Democrats and Christian Republicans. Sometimes um, I, I think, you know, I, I hear people in, in politics and they, they you know, okay, I'm, a, I'm a Christian, I'm a Jesus follower, I'm a Lutheran, I'm a Catholic, I'm a whatever, I'm a Presbyterian, but the way that they, it's okay to have strong opinions. It's good to have strong opinions and it's good to stand for your convictions. But when you say things that sometimes are said or behave in certain ways and then put the name Christian behind your name, change your life or change your name. So I, I think that one of the reasons a lot of folks want nothing to do with Christianity is because they want nothing to do with Christians. Gandhi, what Gandhi said, Gandhi said, you're Jesus I like, it's your Christians I have a problem with. I, I think a lot of people could say that. So, um, to be aware of, of those kinds. So, hallowed be thy name, says God, as I bear your name as a Christian, may others, uh, may your name be hallowed. May, may you be glorified through me. Um, then thy kingdom come, the second petition. And uh, Luther says, uh, the kingdom of God comes indeed without our prayer of itself. But we pray in this petition that it may also come unto us. Um, how is this done? When our Heavenly Father gives us His Holy Spirit so that by His grace we believe His Holy Word and lead a godly life here in time and hereafter in eternity. The kingdom of God, we're not just talking about heaven here. Some people think the kingdom of God is heaven. The kingdom of God is found wherever Christ is present. So the kingdom of God is found right here, right now. Christ is present in his word as we examine his word. The kingdom of God dwells within the heart of a believer in Christ. The kingdom of God um, is present um, up the street at Calvary Community Church as they're gathering. The kingdom of God is present, uh, you know, at, at the local gas station where a Jesus follower is 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 behind the cash register. The kingdom of God is found wherever Jesus is present. It's not a visible kind of a thing. Because you could be in a, in a space where people are singing uh, uh, hymns or something, but where Christ isn't present. That's possible. I'm not making a judgment. The kingdom of God is not a physical location. The kingdom of God dwells where the presence of Christ is. So to say, thy kingdom come, says God, may your presence begin to saturate and permeate all of creation. As your kingdom has come to dwell within me, thank you for that, by the way, God, may your kingdom come to dwell in my neighbor. May your kingdom be present um, in, uh, in uh, the, uh, the House of Congress. May your kingdom be present in the White House. May your kingdom be present in Columbus North High School. May your kingdom be present um, at City Hall of Columbus, Indiana. The kingdom of God is found where the presence of Christ is found. That's not separating church and state. That's not mixing church and state. Because God calls for us, we are to be the yeast that leavens the world. Jesus said we are the light of the world. We're to be the, uh, the light of the world. So God has not put the government in place to fix the world. God's put the government in place to govern and to protect citizens from those who would seek to harm them. God's not put the educational system in place to fix the world. The educational system exists to educate so that young people can become productive citizens. He has called the church to change the world. The body of Christ 
is to infiltrate, not in a militaristic way, but the body of Christ is to infiltrate every aspect of where we are. So where we work, you and I are called to bring the presence of Christ into that setting. That doesn't mean we have to, at the beginning of the day, say, everybody stop, we're going to pray now. No. I mean, you can if you can get away with that. If you're the owner, maybe. But wherever we go, if I am playing a football on a high school football team, I am to bring the presence of Christ in that locker room and on that field. That doesn't mean that I don't hit hard when I'm playing football. That's how you play the game of football. But it does mean I don't intentionally stick my fingers through the face mask and poke a guy's eyes out. It doesn't mean that after I tackle somebody, I kick him uh, when he's down. I'm to bring the presence of Christ, and so are you. That's, so God has called the church, and the church is those of us in a relationship with Christ, to transform the world. That's what we're called to do. That's not the government's responsibility. It's not Hollywood's responsibility. It's not the school system's responsibility. It's not the corporate world's responsibility. It's you and me as fo- Jesus, Jesus followers making a difference in all those different environments so that the world is made a better place, if that makes sense. So thy kingdom come is about the presence of Christ permeating and infiltrating every aspect of society for the good of all humanity. For the good of all humanity. So, as we pray that prayer, let's say, let's say tomorrow you were to say, I'm just going to focus on this petition, thy kingdom come. So I would say, first of all, pray, God, thank you that your kingdom dwells in me. Thank you that you have called me to faith. Thank you that you dwell within me. Secondly, pray for your family. Do all your family members know Jesus? If they do, thank him for that. And pray that he'll continue to nurture them and strengthen them in their relationship with him. But if you have family members who don't know Jesus, then pray for them. God, I pray that you would uh, lead them into a relationship with you. Use me as you see fit. You know, sometimes parents, when they have adult kids, and the kids kind of quit going to church, and, and uh, sometimes like they want to you know, harp on them, and it, it's a fine line. How do you do that without scaring them off? Um, and so how do, how do we lovingly, gently encourage them in that way, pray for them? Not to get into theological arguments with them, but to, that they see the love and the kindness of Christ in us. Pray for our church. You know, I think it's easy sometimes for churches to forget why they exist. Um, and, you know, the church doesn't exist to have a softball team in the summer. The church doesn't exist to run a scout program. The church doesn't exist to do, you know, uh, potlucks. The church doesn't exist to run a school. The church exists to bring the presence of Christ into its community. Now, if we have a school and we have the understanding that the school is there to be used as a tool to bring Jesus into the lives of children and to equip those young people to take the presence of Christ out into their world, that's an okay thing. If we have a church league softball team and the church league softball team exists to encourage and support the men or the women who are on that team in the struggles of life, um, then that's okay. But the purpose of the church, Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations. Those are Jesus followers. That's why we exist. And so when we argue about things like what color is the carpet, or we don't like the color of the paint on the wall, or I don't like that song in church, or that sermon was too long, or that sermon was too short, get over it. (laughs) The church exists to penetrate the community Uh, for the causes of God and that is to bring the presence of Jesus into the world so pray that your church continues to always has that understanding always and that your leaders do always have that understanding and sometimes we can get caught up and I've I've got people who have been in leadership roles in our church before sometimes they can let's quit talking about money and and let's talk about the mission and, and almost all the time, they're good about coming back. But, but that's the squeaky wheel. Do we have enough money to pay for this? Do we have enough money to pay for that? Do we have, and that's the, I mean, we, we have a, like a $7 million plus budget here. That's a lot of money. That is a lot of money. And you have to pay the bills, right? 
I'm glad that we have lights on, that we have heat, we have air, and it's all a part of it. But that we always understand, that we always understand that we exist to penetrate the culture for the cause of Christ. That's why we exist. And I'm thankful that we've got, I mean, our, our, we've got great men and women who understand that. But it's sometimes easy when things go haywire to, to get off track and just always to come back to that. And then to pray for your neighbors. And this is a little thing that I learned, and that says 1030 and that says 1029. So I think we'll pick up there. But, but when we pick up after uh, the week after Easter, I want to pick up on that. How can you begin to pray for your neighbors so that um, the kingdom of God can infiltrate their lives as well? And so we'll pick up there next time. So next week, uh, Easter, join us for one of four services or come to more than one if you want. Uh, we have worship on Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday. So this Thursday, we have worship at 12, 15, and 7 p.m., same service. Come to whichever one works. Uh, Good Friday, um, 12, 15, and 7 p.m., come to whichever one works. Nothing on Saturday, and then four opportunities on Sunday. And then we're back here uh, the weekend after that. So if you will, be sure, if you haven't already, put your name on the, on the white sheet on your table. And if you have any questions, write them down on that 4 by 6 card. And we'll get at them uh, then. So let me close with prayer if I can. Father, thank you uh, that you uh, are our Abba, our Papa, our Daddy. Thank you um, that you invite us to just climb upon your lap and to lean into you and to find a place of rest and peace and comfort and security. Lord, may we, may we be assured of that. May we, may we not go before you with, uh, with fear or, or with, with uh, fright. Uh, but with comfort and with confidence. And we thank you that you have uh, made us your children through the shed blood of your son, Jesus Christ. God, may we, uh, in this most holy week now that we enter into, uh, may we draw closer to you. May we come to appreciate you more fully. May our hearts and minds and spirits and ears and eyes be open to you. And, uh, and may you do in us and through us whatever it is you desire. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for coming.